live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe with your host, Chris Smith. All right, everybody. Let's get started. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Science Cafe. Thanks for coming out this Thursday night. I'm so glad that you could all be with us here tonight for our special presentation. We do, in fact, have a very special evening planned for you. How many of you knew what tonight's topic was before you came? Very good. I was just checking because the title of tonight's presentation is Sex and the Sea. Ooh, okay. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Yeah, that's great. This, this, you all look shrimply amazing tonight. I'm so glad you could be here. And since Valentine's Day come out, I do want to let all of you know, I see a lot of folks here in the Science Cafe every Thursday night. This is a special one because it is so close to Valentine's Day. I just want to let you all know, you octopi my heart on this Science Cafe night. Okay, I'm told. <laughs> yeah, I'm cut off. I'm done. <laughs> I'm going to get drug off the stage by the guest speaker tonight. I do want to, I'll take questions later. Thank you, though. No, I'm not. But for tonight's program, uh, our special guest uh, has actually been here and presented in the museum before on other topics. Terry Kirby Hathaway, marine education specialist from North Carolina at Sea Grant. Fantastic presenter, educator, has done fantastic work here in the state of North Carolina, so I think you're really going to enjoy tonight's presentation. I do want to throw some other bugs in your ear about other stuff coming up here at the museum, though. Tonight, we've got great stuff going on. There are games on your tables that Terry's going to explain. Uh, I think this is the first science cafe that came with a reference sheet. Tomorrow night here at the, somebody's clapping, they're like, yay, vocab. Uh, tomorrow night here at the museum, we have a very special event coming up. Tomorrow night is our adult night, Wild Love. So if you're looking for something to do on a Friday night and you are at least 21 years of age or older, we still have tickets for sale for tomorrow night's program in the museum. If you think that sex in the sea is a really cool topic, Tomorrow night, we are taking on all things love in the animal kingdom through hands-on games, interactive, special exhibitors. People from like the Duke Lemur Center are going to be in the museum. The LGBT Center of Raleigh is going to be in the building. You can dance in the globe. You can get specialty drinks and food from the Daily Planet Cafe, stuff that's not on the normal menu. It's all four floors of the Nature Research Center. Huge event. We're going to have a lot of fun. I'll be here in the cafe hosting Wild Love Bingo. That's, yeah, so tickets, if you buy your ticket tonight, it's $20. If you show up at the door tomorrow, it's 25 So I hope I'll see you all at Wild Love tomorrow night for Valentine's Day. I'll be there. Hope you will, too. Now, I think that was everything that I needed to say. Put your hands together and welcome to the stage, Terry Kirby Hathaway. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll start off with a little quiz. Why did the moray eel cross the road? What, you know? Oh, very good. That's the moray. That was another one, but the real reason is to get to the other tide. And, and why was the shark wearing a tuxedo? It was dressed to kill. And you know, sharks don't really go after people. So that's really, it's just a joke. Nobody take me seriously for that. Take me seriously for other things. So tonight we're going to talk about the, what animals in the ocean and estuaries do to reproduce. We're going to talk about the four Fs of the animal kingdom, and that's feeding, fighting, fleeing, and reproducing. Okay. I know y'all were just waiting for me to say that, weren't you? Okay, so how do marine... Oh, wait, before we get started, I want to tell you about the game we're playing. On um, 15 tables, we have game cards. They're bingo cards, but the title is Spawn. So I'm going to... 
use big words. That's why I gave you a reference sheet. And you mark them off as I say them, not until I say them. And what I want you to mark off is either this shape, an X with the free in the middle, or a plus sign with the free in the middle. So you really only need eight words, okay? And when you get that bingo, an X or a plus, I want you to yell out, stand up and yell out spawn proudly, okay? Because there are, there are prizes for the first one to spawn. Okay. So how do marine and estuarine, estuarine animals reproduce? There are a lot of things that have to be considered, something like um, asexual versus sexual reproduction, uh, external versus internal fertilization, separate sexes, male and female, or are they hermaphrodites and have both in the same animal? Do they have a few large offspring or do they have tons of small ones? And then there's all about the right water characteristics, like the right time, the right place, the right temperature, the right lunar cycle, the right tidal cycle, and the length of daylight. And also a disclaimer, I hope I don't offend anyone by using these words, but I'm gonna use words like cloaca and fecundity and ovoviparous and sperm and oral brooder. So if you're gonna be offended, go ahead and leave now. Okay, and I said a few words right then. I didn't see anybody marking on their paper. Okay. All right, so we'll first talk about is asexual or sexual reproduction. So there's some animals that reproduce asexually, like hydra and like anemones. They bud. That's an asexual reproductive strategy. So if you look at the picture, let's see if my pointer works. Oh, yeah. Okay, right there, there's a bud coming off that hydra right there. Okay, so that's a type of asexual reproduction. They can just, it's almost like cloning themselves. There's also parthenogenesis, which is having an offspring from an egg without having, needing a male present. Okay, there's some great idea. I'm gonna come up with, there are gonna be some lots of good ideas that you guys are really gonna like. Um, rotifers, cladocerans, some sharks use parthenogenesis. Uh, and then sexual examples like oysters, sharks, whales, they all reproduce sexually. All right, next is, is it external fertilization or internal fertilization? External is called broadcast spawning. So that's when the gametes, the egg and the sperm, which are the sex cells, are shed into the water column. And these are things like corals, jellies, uh, bivalves, which are like clams and oysters, et cetera they shed their gametes into the water column, and as the water moves them around, they will find each other and mix. There is internal fertilization. Sperm is placed inside the female by the male. Certain gastropods, squids do this, sharks, certain fishes, marine mammals. Squids do something called confined external fertilization, where the male squid takes a sperm packet and puts it inside the female's mantle where it's held there until she needs it. That's convenient also. <laughs> Other external fertilization, you can see the cloudiness in the water. Uh, corals do this, They're, they do synchronized spawning, not synchronized swimming, but synchronized spawning, where they do this one time a year with a, a million of their neighbors they shed their eggs and sperm into the ocean and the currents mix them together. So at the bottom right picture, you can see the uh, eggs and sperm coming out of the sea urchin. So urchins do this and corals. And internal fertilization, I mentioned the, the squid placing, the male squid placing the uh, sperm packet in the female. We have, here's, I'm gonna teach you some e interesting tidbits. So if you are at the wild love party tomorrow night, you can dazzle the people who weren't here tonight with all these little tidbits of information. The, how to tell the difference between male and female sharks, skates, and rays. The picture right in the middle, okay? That's a female on the left and a male on the right with the claspers. Males have two claspers and they use those to place sperm into the female's cloaca. All right, so that's how you can tell. So the next time you go to the aquariums or anywhere 
and you see sharks, skates, and rays, you can say, hey, that's a male. You know how I can tell? Okay, but here's another really good tidbit. What animal has the largest penis to body ratio in the animal kingdom? Barnacles, yes, barnacles tell no lies. <laughs> barnacles, you see the barnacle, here's a barnacle penis right here coming out of its shell. It's rolled up in the shell and then it rolls out, uncurls, and they have to, they're sessile animals and that means they don't move. They're, when they settle down, they stay where they are. So. They are monoecious, that means they have both sexes in the same animal, but they cannot self-fertilize. So they have to be able to reach into the next barnacle to fertilize the next one. So that's why they need that long penis. And I would um, encourage you to Google Barnacles Tell No Lies. It's a great video that was made in the 80s, and it is hilarious. I don't have time to show it tonight, but go home and watch it with someone you love. Okay, so do they have separate sexes or are they hermaphrodites? All right, dioecious is having two separate sexes. So humans are dioecious. We have males, we have females. Um, monoecious means having both sex organs in one individual. Sometimes some animals can self-fertilize, but most of the time they can't. The barnacle is the one, one example. The, Blue crabs are an example of a dioecious species. You know how to tell the difference between the, how the male and female, the blue crabs, you look at their apron. Yes, males have aprons too, not just females. The males, it's shaped like, well, like, like the Capitol building. No, yeah, no, 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 not the Capitol building. The uh, Empire State Building, the Washington Monument, right here is a, it's right there. Okay, the top, the dome of the Capitol building is a mature female. And the Egyptian pyramid is an immature female. How about that? Okay, so some animals are protandric. That means they're hermaphrodites that function first as a male, and then they can switch to female. If there's too many males around and they need females, then they, one will switch to be a female. Another really convenient thing sometimes. Um, the shells, the snails that are on the left, that is the slipper shell. They start out as, they're protandric, they start out as a male first. The bottom one is a male, and then the next one settles on top. And if that's a male, then the male on the bottom turns into a female. They get fertilized from above. Now, I always like this because their, their um, scientific name is Crepidula fornicata. Get your mind out of the gutter. It's named for the, the Greek word for arch, forne. Look it up. I'm telling the truth. Okay, the other um, hermaphrodite that changes sex is a protogynous. This means it's female first, and then it changes to male. Groupers do this. Rasses do this. Parrotfish do this. One thing about the, pro, let me go back to the protandric ones. The anemone fish, the little clownfish, they are protandric. So they have a male and female that are the main, um, it, it, the main fertilizing ones in a group. If the female leaves or dies, then the male changes into the female and the next oldest male will come up and be her partner. So think about if the people who made Finding Nemo really knew what they were talking about. Because if Nemo's mom left, Nemo's dad would have changed into Nemo's mom and Nemo's cousin would have changed into Nemo's dad, and it would have been a whole different movie. <laughs> so some animals, yes, some animals have, oh, we have a question already? In order, Wait. To spawn, in order to spawn, do you have to go through the free space? No, no. Well, yes, you do. You have to do the X, an X, remember an X or a plus. So it's going to include the free space. You weren't going to be premature, were you? <laughs> I'm glad I caught you. Okay. Am I turning red? Because I feel like I'm turning red. 
Okay, so some animals have large single offspring, like whales. They may have one or two, so that the animal is large when it comes out, when it's born, and it's ready to take care of itself. But then there are others that have thousands, thousands of embryos and zygotes and babies that come out in the hopes that a couple of them will make it to adulthood. In fact, the sea turtles, only one in a thousand eggs laid makes it to adulthood. So that's why they have so many, because a lot of things end up being food for other animals. So they get used up, but. All right, and then we talk about the right time, the right place, the right phase of the moon, the right tidal cycle, which has to do with the moon. Is it high tide? Is it low tide? Some spawn at different, some spawn at low tide, some spawn at high tide. Season, the water temperature and the salinity may be the triggering factor to get things going for these animals. The length of day or the amount of light, that also has an effect. Now, two new words for your vocabulary, anadromous. Spawn, we have a spawn, that wasn't very loud. Did you get, you did your X and your Y, your X, or you gotta do both. Another premature spawner. Uh-oh, keep going, keep going. Now, X or plus, X or a plus, X or a plus. Wait, this will be a good time to show them again. There's the plus, goes through the free space, and then there's the X, goes through the free space. Okay, back to our vocabulary words. We have anadromous, these are fishes that, that are they're spawn in fresh water, but as an adult, they live in salt water. Okay, so like a striped bass, rockfish, they're anadromous. Also, salmon, lampreys, American and the hickory shads are also anadromous. The opposite of that kind of opposite is catadromous. And there's only one species that we know of that's catadromous. That means it lives in fresh water as an adult and spawns in salt water, and that's the American eel. So they are catadromous. Now let's look at some ex exceptions to these rules that I've been telling you. There's an exception, the jellies. The jellies go through sexual and asexual reproduction. So if you see the life cycle circle there, you, they start out, their, their larval stage is called a planula in the bottom right of that circle. And then it settles down and develops into a polyp that as it matures, it becomes a strobula. And then it buds off little baby jellies that are called ephyra. And then they develop into the medusa stage, which is the bell-shaped stage, which is what we're all familiar with going to the beach. Okay, and comb jellies that are re very closely related to true jellies, they are monoecious and they self-fertilize and they broadcast spawn. So there are lots of different exceptions with the jellies. Another exception, which is a really good one that the ladies like, is the male, uh, the seahorse. The female places the eggs inside the male's pouch where he fertilizes them and he holds on to them until they hatch out of his belly. It's 21 day incubation. So people, ladies usually like seahorses for good reason. Okay, and then the catfish, the sea cats, which we have a couple species um, that are here in North Carolina. These are not the freshwater catfish, but they're the saltwater ones. They, the males, if you look at the big mouth, bottom right, that is, that's the eggs, the fertilized eggs. You see the big egg yolk. The male holds them in his mouth. He orally broods them. So he's an oral brooder. He does not eat. He holds them in his mouth until they absorb their yolk sac and then swim away. So we like those daddy catfishes too. But here's my real favorite, the angler fish. You know, these guys live in the really deep, dark depths. It's hard to find each other, but when they do, the male, which is a lot smaller than the female, bites the female. And when he does, he fuses into her body. And every bit of his tissue falls away, rots away, except for the sperm sacs. So he's just a sack of sperm attached to the female. 
So if you see the picture on the bottom right, you see that little bitty, there's that little bitty male right there. Now, some, some specimens that have been collected um, and that are maybe in the Smithsonian or in other fish collections, they have females with at least five or six males attached to her. So th another convenience thing, very convenient. So it's just a s sperm is available when it's needed. Okay, other exceptions. I like these exceptions a whole lot better than the normal stuff. Shark skates and rays. There are ex exceptions to the rule also. The reason being we have oviparous sharks, which are ones that ha lay eggs outside the body. Skates do this too. You found the mermaid's purses. Okay, that's an oviparous animal. It has eggs laid outside the body. Horn sharks, cat sharks do that. Then we have viviparous, which are the ones that are born alive. There's an, um an umbilical cord type connection between the mother and the embryo. So those are born alive, viviparous hammerheads do that. And then there's some that do a combination where the mother has the babies are in an egg sac, but the eggs are maintained inside her body until they hatch inside and then they swim out and hatch. So they swim out alive, but they're inside an egg case. And that's called ovoviviparous. But what another neat thing, see that word down at the bottom left, adelphophagy? That means eat your brother. Latin for eat your brother. Um, <clears throat> sand tiger sharks, which are the ones that are usually in captivity that have the big mouth with the teeth. They can't shut their mouth. They have so many teeth. A little tidbit, sharks, female sharks have two uteri, one down each side of her body. Not a single one like female humans have and other ant mammals, but two. So she will have a lot of different babies inside her uteri. The first one in each uterus that hatches eats the rest of the brothers or sisters. That's how they survive. They don't have a yolk sac, so the only way they can survive. So the first two that develop eat the rest of them, and then the, those first two are the only ones that are born. Yeah, if you're the first one, it's nice. Not so nice if you're not the firstborn. Oh, okay, little bit, just a little bit of flashcards here. Evidence on the beach of sex in the sea, and I'm not talking about leftover things that guys left, okay? We're talking about egg cases. Okay, so when you walk on the beach and find all these egg cases, you know that there's been some stuff going on there. All right, who knows what this one is? I can't see that far, so I'm gonna have to look this way. Oh, there's a bunch of different ones in there, okay. Anybody know that one? You ever find that one on the beach? That is a waved whelk. That's its egg case. All right. Moon snail, yes. Yeah, so that's called a collar, a sand collar. If it's dry, it's very brittle and just falls apart, but it's a mixture of fertilized eggs, sand, and good goo. Yeah, that sticks it all together. Okay, there's another one. That is the uh, tulip shell. Looks like um, those uh, what bugles you used to eat when you were a kid. So that's how they lay their eggs. And then those are murex that are laying all those little egg cases on rocks. They're attached to rocks. Okay, and this is a pear whelk. This is how the egg, what the egg cases look like. And then there's some more um, Florida rock snails. And that's what the horse conch egg cases look like. And then that's an oyster drill that lays its eggs like that. So a lot of times you'll find the egg cases have washed up on the beach. And I'm sure you've seen this, the whelk egg cases. Yeah. So we have three species of whelks here, the knobbed, the lightning, and the channeled. And all of their egg cases, those capsules look a little different. Oop, and we also have skates. We have two different species of skates. The one on the right is a clear nose skate, and the one on the left is a little skate. So we have two different kinds of skate egg cases, also called mermaid's purses. 
Okay, now holoplankton versus meroplankton. Some animals have babies that are part of the plankton. They're, they're called meroplankton because they don't spend their entire lives as part of the plankton. They're only part, they're there for their larval stage and then they develop into a familiar looking adult. And the holoplankton is the ones that are planktonic their whole lives. Who's spawning over here? Okay, you have the X or the, or the plus? Okay, congratulations. Did, did you have help? Say yes, because I have multiple <laughs> prizes. Yes, I had help. Okay. You really do need help to spawn sometimes. Thank you. I'll give you a prize at the end, okay? All right. So, let's see what else we got. All right. We're going to do a little um, matching game here. I want you to look at the, I'm going to show you a larval stage, and then you're going to call out what animal it's going to develop into. Uh -huh. A pumpkin is not right. <laughs> it's a good guess. But no, that's coral. That's what a juvenile, a larval stage of a coral looks like. It's called a planula larvae. Jellyfish, very good. I know you've seen this one, so yes, that's a moon jelly. Ephira. All right. How about this one? No. Oh, that's a good guess. No. It's a copepod. That doesn't help? Copepod. Okay, wait. I'll put that up. Okay. Doesn't it look like the real thing? This, the, you know, plankton is... Just to let you know, SpongeBob SquarePants was developed by a marine biologist. So he, he does have some little artistic license with things. But this little guy, Plankton, is, if you look at the, the copepod in the middle there, it looks just like him. One big eye, two antenna. Okay. It's really funny. But that is the juvenile stage of a copepod, which is not a, it's a holoplankton. It stays uh, in the plankton its entire life. And there's a female with two egg sacs hanging down. All right, what about this one? All right, very good. It is a crab, but it's a fiddler crab. But that's all right. Crabs, crab, that's called a zoea larval stage. And most crabs go through seven zoeal stages. And then they develop into another stage. And I think I have a picture of that one, so I don't want to give it away yet. Oh, what is that one? It is a barnacle. That's called a nauplius larval stage of a barnacle. <laughs> You're not looking at... you. You seeing a penis in that picture? Oh my goodness. What about this one? It's called a cypress larvae. Trick question. It's the next stage, a larval stage of a barnacle. So they go through nauplia stages and then one um, cypress stage and then they settle down. All right. What about this one? No, somebody who said, who said lobster a while ago? That's a phylosoma larval stage of a spiny lobster. Now remember, these are microscopic. These are tiny, and they develop into these big things that we eat. It's pretty amazing how they don't look a daggone thing like the adult. Oh, what are these? Clams. That's what a baby clam looks like. It's called a villager larvae. What is that one? That was cute, isn't it? Oh, well, it's too late. Somebody's already spawned before you, but thank you. <laughs> we only take the first spawners. <laughs> okay, that is a, a moon snail larval stage. Come on, what are they? Squid, very good. Yeah, they, they're the only ones that really look like themselves. Oh, what in the world? That looks like a little dancing man. That's a sea star, a brittle star. Oh, that's an interesting looking one. See, I really think that anybody who designed aliens for movies has looked at planktonic samples. Because some of these things are really strange. That's a heart urchin or a mud urchin. I know. And that's another sea star. So we got the brittle star up top and the, then the sea star. Okay. It's another sea star. <laughs> but it looks more like a sea star than the other thing. Is that one? <laughs> it looks like 
a sextant. No, that's a sea urchin. An Ophiopludius. Oh, this is an interesting one. This is, if you see the dark, see the dark things right around here? This is behind Hatteras Island. This is in the sound, and that was about 15 feet long. When you get closer to it and look at it up close, what's making it this color, the dark color, are these little spots, and those are the larval fish. This is actually called an egg veil. This is the, the egg case for this animal, which is called, um, it's called a goosefish or an allmouth, but it's monkfish. If you've ever eaten monkfish, you see why they changed the name. Most people wouldn't eat goosefish or whatever. But yeah, so that's their, they lay their eggs in these egg veils, these long egg veils. And this one, and they're way offshore. This one floated in through Hatteras Inlet and was, happened to be behind somebody's house. It's actually somebody who worked here at the museum. So this Baird took that picture. Yeah, it's pretty cool though. All right, we have just a few more. What's that going to be? It is going to be an eel, yeah. A conger eel. It's called a leptocephalus larval, larval stage. Oh. It is a fish of some time. It is, I'll just give you a hint. It's my favorite, favorite fish. In fact, it's my, no, not the, not the, langu, the angler fish, but the ocean sunfish. The mola mola, that's my license plate, is la mola. <laughs> okay, that's it for the um, talk part. I am done, but we're going to be handing out, I do have a, Who's your daddy worksheet? So I've got larval stages on the left, adult stages on the right, and just use your markers and match them up. If you can, draw a line from the larval stage. No prizes. This is one for you to just play with and take home with you. And I'm ready to take questions. Let's Anybody give Terry a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you Thank very you. much. Great job. <laughs> This one oh, is a fun one. I've done this program with high school students, too. They get so embarrassed at an old lady standing up in front of their class talking about penises. I was going to ask, who giggles more, us or a group of high schoolers? Then? Oh, the high schoolers are too embarrassed to giggle. An all-girls group, an all-ladies group, I've done this for, like, the women's club and whatever, they giggle. I mean, they giggle. It's very giggly. Okay. So, yeah, let's take questions uh, so that everybody knows Wave at us if you have a question. We'll bring a microphone to you. That way everybody in the room can hear. Uh, if you're sitting there way off in the back, just keep waving. We'll be checking. I see you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and uh, we've got plenty of time to get to as many questions, I think, as we can. So I wonder what the implications of the uh, um, sort of cloning or the parthenogenesis mm -hmm. are for kind of survival, you know, short circuits the creation of variation True. that would come from sexual reproduction. And I wonder what, if yeah. if it sort of limits the um, this kind of long-term survival prospects for those species. It probably does to a certain extent, but most of the time the parthenogenesis that I'm familiar with is in kind of desperation. It's when there's no males around, they're deep water animals, like the cat sharks that do that. Um, they do it because there's, there's no male. They don't know when they'll find a male. They've got eggs that are ready to go. So they do that. And I, I don't know about the, I think with the anemones, it's just convenience. But it, I'm sure it does mess with the gene pool if you keep just cloning yourself, just like it would with humans. But probably not as bad. Do you know W.C. Fields' last words? No, I don't. I'm going to regret this, but what were W.C. Uh, Fields? The nurse words? asked him, nurse asked him if he wanted a glass of water. And he said, fish propagate in water. But he didn't say propagate. Oh, well, that's true. Those were his last words. 
I'll have to remember that for the next time I do this because that's a good that's a good thing to know. But that's another thing to keep in mind is that all this broadcast spawning. I'm sure you've been in the ocean and taken a mouthful of ocean water. Just think about it, <laughs> or not, or, or don't. <laughs> yes. So um, I heard you say that some of these creatures have cloquia and birds have cloquia. So is that a genetic connection somewhere, or strictly a hardware? I think it's strictly hardware. I don't know enough about the genetics of it and the descendants, but I don't think, I'm thinking back on the phylogenetic tree, I don't think so. I don't think it's related that way. And not all of these animals do, sharks do, which is where all the things come together, all their, everything comes together and goes out one hole in the cloaca. Okay, okay. These guys are small, so I assume that they eat algae or something, can you? Discuss their place in the food chain. Which and ones? All of the microscopic, all of these oh, guys at this size. All the plankton? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, they're, they're the basics, basis of the food chain after the sun. I mean, it's sun, then the phytoplankton, then the zooplankton. And some things go straight for the plankton, like some of the larger animals. Um, whales eat krill. They eat very low on the, on the food pyramid, the energy pyramid. Um, but then something, a lot of baby fish, lots of small fishes and small oysters or whatever are filter feeding these plankton, straining them out of the water. And then they grow up and eat larger things. And so they do, they're the base. If we didn't have the sun or the phytoplankton or the zooplankton, we wouldn't have anything else. So very important. Yes. Okay, this, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. <laughs> You're welcome. My question was inspired by the brain what do you call an alligator with a vest? I don't know. An investigator. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. An investigator. All right, I got to remember that. Um, hi. Uh, hi. I was just wondering, you brought up the different types of like anadromous and Catadromous, am I saying that right? Not really, but okay. <laughs> wondering um how that change in solidity would affect the fish. Would that not be would that not negatively affect them or is it because they gradually get used to it? Gradually get used to it, they can osmoregulate, so they can go back and are either freshwater or saltwater, maybe brown they're able to osmoregulate and deal with that salt and the change in the salinity. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is the bull shark. Bull shark can be as a type, a subspecies of the bull shark has been found in um, Lake Nicaragua. And they have seen bull sharks up the Atchafalaya River, 150 miles north of the Gulf of Mexico. So yeah, that is one shark that can, can go from fresh to salt, or salt to fresh, back and forth. Okay. What is the advantage of intrauterine um, cannibalism over having yolks? Like why would That's a good question. I do not know the answer. But I don't know what it is. It just makes a good story. Next question's way in the back. Okay. I, I'm here with my beautiful wife, Emily. <laughs> do do fish or something they're looking for in the a partner or a mate, or is it just kind of random? Each other. Most of it is broadcast. Spawn. I have a long-term partner. It's broadcast spawn. How much do we know about? Um, the impact on reproduction in the sea of temperature change. I know that there, I'm sure there's people. There are people studying that. The other thing about is the effect on reproduction um, that are shed by all of us that have taken birth control pills or estrogen pills or whatever. All that stuff is goes out. They're finding is endocrine disruptors, and it's changing how fish and other animals reproduce or how they develop their, their sex organs, develop the uterus, the testes, all of that. So they're doing a lot of research into that too. That's really interesting, kind of concerning, so. Thank you for the talk, very good. Um, how do they move between stages? Is there like a pupil form of some of these things or? No, they just really, they just change. They eat or feed some, on something and get a bit a little bit larger and change. The zoeal stages are like that. They just, they just 
shift a little bit. They might, something falls off, they grow something else to change the shape. So I'm curious, how, how do warming oceans affect lots of these different creatures? Like I'm familiar with temperature dependent uh, marine Alligators, turtles and sea turtles, yeah, yeah, reptiles. Some of these fish and all these different strategies that a lot. Of water temperature is the range it's expansion. Fishes, you know, Cape Hatteras is like the dividing line between the northern species and southern species. Um, so on the Outer Banks, which is where I'm based, we get a lot of the northern ex, northern. Ex, southern extent of the northern species range. So here in North Carolina, like we have Maine lobsters and spiny lobsters. Starting to move. I'm finding things on the beach that are southern species that I've never found, and I've lived on the Outer Banks for 35 years. So I've been beach coming out there for 35 years. And I'm finding things, you know, for the last five years that I've never seen before, and I have used to see them in Wilmington, and now they're moving. So the expansion of the range, I think, the ones that are going to have the biggest problem are the cold water animals because where are they going to go? They can't only go so far to expand their range. So I don't, I don't know the answer except that that's what I know. I don't think the reproductive strategies are going to – and so, you know, finding a mate might be a little harder if the range has expanded. So. You mentioned that you're seeing more southern species mm -hmm. on the beach. Are you seeing fewer northern species? Not Are there range yet. moving? That I'm not noticing the absence of something, although I'm noticing for that. And that's just you know, me walking on the beach at least once a week. The um, question was how problem um, because they're eating. They eat everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, they're doing some programs where they've uh, tried to cook them and serve them so that people realize you can eat the lionfish. You just have to know how to clean them because they have the venomous spines. North of Cape Hatteras, I haven't heard, but I don't keep up with it. I'm both heard. Oh, what kind of environmental or evolutionary pressures are change their reproductive ways like I know the horseshoe crab hasn't um but I know that there are some other animals that have changed that I don't know any I'd love you to tell me what the strategies because I don't I, I can't I can't think of any from the top yeah I get yeah, because you're right about the horseshoe crabs have been around for 350 million years I love them. <laughs> I love them too. Yeah, they're very cool. But yeah, I you know the only thing with the range expansion, find a mate, so they're maybe going more to the parthenogenesis, whatever. But I, I don't I don't know of any. Now the ocean would have to do anything about like just reproduction in general, especially when it comes to external fertilization. Probably not to reproduction itself, but to the fact that if the animals going to last long enough to reproduce. Okay, yeah. Like clams, oysters, thinning, or the, the, the smaller ones. So they may not make it to be adults if they don't, aren't able to create that shell because the ocean has gotten less basic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Others, raise your hand if you got one more. All right, looks like we got one more question. Okay. After this one, though. Even me? Even you. Okay, good. In the anglerfish, where the male becomes essentially a parasite mm -hmm. on the female, are they broadcast spawning, or how does the sperm get to the female? Well, it's part of her body. When he bites her, he, he fuses to her. I mean, it's, it, she can use that sperm whenever there's a duct that is created by him biting her, and it just creates, and she goes right into her body when she can use it. Whenever she's ready, he's not. It's not dead. There's still the sperm. He's gone as an individual. He's gone. He's just a sack of sperm, but that's still alive. Good question, though. Well, thank you guys very much for coming. Please take home the references. And on.
down in the, and I'll pick up the, the uh, don't leave the spawn. I'm sorry. That's not what I meant to say. <laughs> leave the cards and I'm going to just embarrass myself. The, the, I know. Come up later. My email address is on the reference sheet. If you've got any kind of questions, you find something on the beach when you're vacationing next summer, please send it to me because I would love to know what your probably figure it out for you. So thanks again. I really appreciate Excellent job. <laughs> Ton of fun, and we learned a lot. That's always great. Now, I have a very special surprise for everybody here tonight and anyone who might be watching our broadcast. The Living Poets joined us tonight, oh, which a group of amazing writers who've joined us for the started their poetry when the talk started, and now they're going to get up and read. Let me introduce the group. Living Poets, they'll introduce and I'll pass it off to them. Thanks for being here. Thank you. And uh, our group is Living Poetry. Uh, you can check us out on livingpoetry.net and Bartholomew Barker. Uh, my is called Mermaid Vision. I, I touched the sea. I never left. My hand cupped like a clamshell, reached off the dock by cul-de-sacs of barnacle suburbia. So tight and settled down, I later heard whispers on the way real estate on the piling by the tide line for sun on dry days and milky moonlit nights. I went deeper and caught a glimpse of the crab's kitchen where they wiped their aprons, satisfied with their meals. Further, I found the spreading hydra who told me secrets how I could be fluid. There I was, another me, another me. Another me, one a crazy sea cat lady whose cats hold eggs in their mouths like candy. Another me, an horse ranch, and the real me, trapped in between of all around. My name is Anna Weaver. With the feeding, the fighting, and the fish tailing at Fathom, finally find time for that fourth F. Feeling fabulous, getting freaky, looking fetch as a frisky barnacle, filling into the falling into the fatal fusing attraction of the angler fish, flirting, fluttering, flushing, or male or dancing an unforgettable fever, a truth more ferocious than fiction. My name is Dan Bull. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Sex in the sea requires a reference. Tuxedos. They're shaken, not stirred. Fleeing, fighting, reproducing. How do they do it? The right time, the right place, under the moon, at the beach, what turns an oyster on? Broadcast spawning. Hashtag me too. <laughs> Confined external insemination is all about consent. Dazzle the wild love party by demonstrating your class burst. Fertilized by, a, by above. Get your mind out of the gutter. Is it high tide? Is it low tide? Is there a light rain on the beach? Be the 1,000th turtle. <laughs> Polyp, strobila, ephedra, medusa. Ladies love a seahorse. Big mouth, bottom right, oral brooding, swim away. It's hard to find each other in the dank, dark depths. Imagine you're inside eating your brother. Planktonic relationship at the mercy of the ocean. A pumpkin, snowflake, plankton. SpongeBob is in love with a squirrel. Crabs take forever. We only take the first spawners. <laughs> My 
My name is Bartholomew Barker. Take me to the aquarium. I love the dim lighting, the subdued sounds. They should sell wine there. It'd be better than a singles bar. We all know that sex in a bathtub just doesn't work. I need something more pelagic. The oceans are practically filled with gametes looking for a home. Imagine if we'd taken a strange natural selection eons ago. I'd carry your eggs in my mouth or cling to your side until I love. <laughs> Thank you. That was awesome. I want awesome. everybody to give these I folks one more round of applause. Yay. Everybody for coming out. All right. Well, if you're not ready for Valentine's Day, I don't have any help <laughs> for you at this point. Folks, thanks for coming out to the Science Cafe. I uh, sure science cafes. I can tell you that about who studies human animal relationships, you can learn why you have pets at next week's Science Cafe. That's what we'll be talking all about. And if you want to know what's coming up for the rest of the month, March, April, May, and June, Put your email address on that survey form that's on the table that's scattered all around the room. We'll add you to the newsletter so that you know it's coming up every single month here at the Science Cafe. You can join me. You can join Katie. We'll be here ready to learn something new and have a little bit of fun. Thanks for coming out, everybody. Travel safe. We'll see you next time. Good night.